Good day, this is Joe Joya coming to you from Brighton, Colorado, from the Healing Place in Brighton, Colorado once again. Uh, I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention today. I'm going to ask you for a favor to pay particular attention today because no matter how much I resist it, no matter how much I fight against it, I am getting older and my voice does not project like it used to. So I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention. Also, another reason I'm going to ask you to pay, pay particular attention today is that I'm going to go over some very difficult scriptures. And you may have a different take on those scriptures. Once again, let me remind you, I'm not the pastor of the Healing Place. I'm just a, a member, and I'm on the board. So uh, don't be upset with the Healing Place. Don't be upset with the pastor. If you're going to be upset because you have a different take on the scripture, be upset with me. So let's turn to, to uh, 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to get there in a second. Chapter 3, and I want to start at verse 4. Because I want to talk about sin, and you know, it's not a very popular subject, but let's see what John says about it. Chapter 3, starting at verse 4. Whoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Now that sounds very legalistic, doesn't it? I'll read that again. Whoever committeth sin transgresseth the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Of the law. So that sounds very legalistic. And in the Old Testament, you know, people treated the law of God like the law of man, in this sense. In the law of man, we know that we can get away on a technicality. We could, you know, we could try to prove that maybe they didn't read us our rights or whatever, for whatever reason, we're not guilty. Maybe we are guilty, but we can prove that we're not guilty through a technicality. Now, I want you to know the law of God is not like that. But this is the way the Old Testament looked at the law. Remember, remember in Jesus' day there are many lawyers and doctors of the law? That's because they tried to prove their own, they tried to work out their own rights, trying to prove that they were justified in themselves, that they weren't breaking the law. And in other laws, they, they went overboard. That's why Jesus said you spread, strain at a, at a gnat and you swallow a camel. Remember Jesus said that? You, you guys strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. So when we talk about the law, Think about it this way, not as a written law that we can try to finagle or try to, try to find some way that we can get out of it or some way that would justify it before it. But think of it as the law of God, the nature of it. Remember God's law, God's law reflected his nature. What he was saying was this when he gave the law. He was saying, if you can do, if you can do the law, if you can keep the law, and the law was really his standard, his moral standard, was himself. That was the law. It was like being like God. So if you can be like me, I'll let you into heaven. You'll be forgiven. You'll be justified. Okay? But he knew that man couldn't be that way. So remember, he promised us, the promise of a Savior was before the promise of the law. It was before the law was given, the promise of a Savior was given. The law was given, and Scripture tells us in Galatians, that the law was given as a school teacher to bring us unto Christ. It's supposed to teach man that he needed to put his faith in the promise of a Savior that was given before the law, because man couldn't keep the law. The law told man what he's supposed to do, but it couldn't make, change man, make man able to keep, to do what God wanted to be like God, to do what God wanted to do. Remember, heaven is a perfect place, and if God let you and me into it, it would not be perfect anymore, unless we change, unless there was a change in us. So that's what it really is about. It's about the change in us. Salvation, I like to say, is more than just a doctrine to believe. It's a life to live. And it's the empowerment, the enabling power to live that life. Okay? So when we look at this, the, the commandments of God, we can look at them this way. We can look at them and we can say, well, it says to do this and not to do that, to do it, not to do that, to do this. And otherwise, you're going to go to hell. Otherwise, I'm going to be punished. I'm going to go to hell. Or we can look at them as a promise. God promises, I will help you do this, and I'll help you not to do that, I'll help you do this, and I'll help you not to do that, and you will make it to heaven. Okay, that's salvation. That's true salvation. So, let's, let's look a little deeper. Grace, we're saved by grace, we know that. Okay, but grace doesn't mean that there's nothing involved in, that, in grace. There's no work involved in grace. See, see people struggle with works and grace. But the scripture, Paul said in the scripture, I am what I am by the grace of God. But the grace he bestowed upon me was not in vain, because I labored. 
more than you all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was upon me. So he brought grace and works together, okay? See what he's saying? He says, you know, he said, if it's by works, then it's no longer grace. If it's by grace, it's no longer, then, the, then it's no longer works. So the, if it was by the grace, it was no longer works. Paul didn't say, I'm working this out. God is working through me. God is working through me. And it's, it's the grace of God. Otherwise, the grace of God is in vain, a vain grace. That's what a lot of people have is a vain grace. We don't want to have a vain grace. Vain grace just says, well, you know, Jesus died for my sins. I'm forgiven for everything I ever did. I'm forgiven for everything I, that I'll do in the future. And I can just keep on sinning and do whatever I want. And the blood of Christ is going to forgive me and I'm forgiven. And it doesn't matter. No, you have, there's repentance involved. You have to turn to God. Repentance is not, I used to do this and now I don't do that. I do this. Repentance, that's a result of repentance. But repentance is just turning to God. Turn to God. God, I need you. You see, again, in the Old Testament, they try to, try to establish their own righteousness by being technical about the law, having doctors of the law and lawyers trying to say, well, you didn't really sin, you didn't really commit any sin, you know, you found a way out. That's not the way it is. Either you're guilty or you're not guilty. Either you're justified or you're not justified. And the only way you can be justified is through Christ. He paid the penalty for our sins. He paid the price on the cross. Now, the reason he did that is so that there be nothing between us and God, so we can go to God and receive what we need to be the people that God wants us to be, to receive that anointing. There's an anointing. See, you know, some Christian celebrity once said, the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that a Christian is forgiven and a non-Christian isn't. That's not the difference. The difference is that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, that we have received the Spirit of God into us, and, and the Spirit of God is empowering us to live differently, to live life according to God's plan. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect, but we're learning. We're in the process of being perfected. We're a lot better off than we were before, and we're growing, and we're maturing, and we're bearing fruit. He said, I'll prune you. I'll prune out of your life the things that hinder you, so you bear more fruit. He said, if you're not bearing fruit, and what is the fruit? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the nature of the character of Christ himself. Again, it's the law. It's the law. That's what it is. The law. So, we see that we see that we can't we can't sin after we're saved. You know, God gives us a free will. We can freely, and, and His will maybe sometimes may have a different opinion, but we have a free will. We can freely come to God, and we can freely turn from God. After we receive Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. Now, this is the thing, too. We can't receive Christ. A lot of people want Christ as their Savior, but they don't want Him as their Lord. They want to, they want to escape eternal damnation, but they don't want to live life according to God's will. Okay? They still want to do what they want to do. Now, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we must accept him as our Lord, too. He is Lord. You know, there's an old song that used to say, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. He has to be Lord of everything in our life. He's our Lord. We're going to follow him. And he enables us, empowers us. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just stay there. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven to send for a purpose, to send the Holy Spirit back to us that can dwell in us so we be temples of the Holy Spirit, that we can draw the strength from God, that we can acknowledge our weakness, that we can acknowledge our need for God. See, what God is looking for from us is simply to acknowledge, God, I need you. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness because I messed up. And I need your power and your strength to help me, to strengthen me, not to, not to sin again, to live right, to live the way you want me to live. I can't live that way. See, that's what we have to come to the... To, to understanding that we can't be what God wants us to be without him. In other words, put it this way, holiness or righteousness or holiness is not the way to God, but God is the way to holiness. If we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and we, draw, and we acknowledge our weakness and our need for him, he will come and he will strengthen us and enable us to live differently, to rise above our flaws, our shortcomings, our faults, our sin and to rise above that and be the people that God wants us to be. We can't make ourselves happy. We have to come to that conclusion. Otherwise, we're lost. If we think we can, we can be what God wants us to be on our own, we're lost. It will never happen. But if we acknowledge that we need forgiveness, that we need God's help, God is there to help. That's all God is looking for. So for us to acknowledge, him. God, I need your forgiveness. I need your, and it's more than just forgiveness. I need your help. I need your empowerment. I want to live life differently. I want to live life according to your will. You know, I told my wife the other day, when I was young, I tried to do the right thing because I was afraid of the consequences of doing the wrong thing. 
and I still didn't do the right thing many times. Then as I matured, I started doing the right thing just because it was the right thing to do. And as I did that, I matured even more and began to realize that I love doing the right thing, that now I'm doing the right thing because I love to do it, because I love God and I love His ways. Remember the scripture says, God is love. Now remember, love is not God, God is love. It's a difference. If you don't know God, then you don't know true love. You may love like a human loves, but you don't love like God loves. Remember, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's his commandment. And we don't have to go any further than that to see that we fall short. Of Does any of us, no matter how much we love someone, do we love them as much as Jesus loved them? Do we love them the way Jesus loved them? I don't think we do. I know I don't. So I need forgiveness. I need mercy. I need help to, to, to rise to the challenge, to love them more, to, to be more like Christ, to love them more like Christ would love them. And I can't make myself do that. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. Okay, so we need Jesus, we need the Lordship of Christ, we need the Holy Spirit to empower us, to anoint us, to enable us to live differently, to live by the Spirit. Now, let me, let me share another scripture. Well, let me share a couple of scriptures. One from, he, from Hebrews, let me see. I've got them here, Hebrews. The 10th chapter, Hebrews 10, 20 to 29, 26 to 29. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law, in the Old Testament, the law of Moses, died without mercy under two or three witnesses, of how much sore punishment suppose ye should be thought worthy of those who have trod underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of his covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing. He hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. See, grace, grace doesn't mean we can just sin. Grace, matter of fact, you know, under grace things are even more strict than under, than under the law. Because under the law it says, Thou shalt not kill. But under grace it says, If you're angry with your brother without cause, you already are guilty of murder. Okay? So it's, again, it's talking about our, the attitude of our heart. Okay? The, 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 the um, attitude of our heart, the, the, the inclination of our heart, the determination of our heart. That's a better way to put it. The determination of our heart. We as Christians are determined not to sin. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of sin. But there's a difference between willfully sinning. When I willfully sin, that's saying, I know this is wrong, and I'm going to do it anyway, because I want to do it, and I think God will forgive me, God, God's gracious, and He'll forgive me. That's different. But it's telling us here that if we willfully sin after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Okay? How do Christian sins? Now, let me, let me explain to you how Christian sins. Let's, let's say you're driving, let me use the law of man for a minute. You're driving down the highway, and the speed limit is 45. And you're going 45, or maybe even going 40, because you want to make sure that you're under the speed limit. So you're going 40, and all of a sudden, without you noticing it, the grade of the, of the road starts to go downhill. And it's, it gets steeper and steeper. And then you, you're driving along, and then you realize, hey, you know, I'm, I think I'm going a little bit too fast. So you look at your speedometer, and you're doing 53 now. So you, look, so you take your foot off the gas pedal, and you put it on the brake, and you go slow down again to 40 or 45. Okay, so now you're legal. Did you break the law? Did you sin? Did you break the law? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You're human, so you know no cop is probably going to stop you. They're probably going to say, well, he did slow down right away. You realize that he slowed down. But you did sin. So that's the way our Christian sins. This Christian sins when he, like he doesn't know for sure that he's sinning. But when it, you know, the scripture tells us to abstain from all appearance of evil. Now let me let me let me explain that a little bit too. My another take on it. A lot of people take that as how a Christian his appearance. Okay. Now if we would take Christians from all over the world, from every from every time from every time from all over the world, we get them all together. They would look so different. They won't. They're not going to look the same. They're not going to have the same clothes, the same haircut, the same. They're not going to look the same. They're not going to appear the same. But listen to this. Suppose when it says. 
uh, abstain from all appearance of evil, it's saying this. When something becomes apparent to you that there's evil in it, don't abstain from it. You may be watching a certain show or a certain movie or whatever it is, and you may think nothing of it or doing a certain thing, and you may think nothing of it. When, you, when it becomes apparent to you that there's evil involved in that, then, you're gonna, then you should abstain from it, okay? So think of it that way. Think of it that way. So when we're going downhill, okay, we're driving downhill, we realize that we're going too fast, then we've got to stay for that. We're going to slow down. We're going to, we're going to take our foot off the gas pedal. We're going to maybe tap the brake a little bit. We're going to slow down and get back on track. We've sinned. We have to acknowledge. We've sinned. We, we, we were going too fast. We sinned. We, we, we broke the law. We were sinned. We're guilty. We're guilty. But, see, man would say, well, you're not guilty. You're not guilty. You didn't know it, so you're not guilty. You know, ignorance of the law is no excuse, the scriptures. Now, even, even the law of man says that. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So we can't, so anything that's contrary to the nature of God, when we say the law, when we think about the law, don't think about it as a written law, but think about it as the nature of God, God himself, what he's like, okay, his nature. So if we're, anything that's contrary to the nature of God is sin. It's not just, you just can't say that, you know, this, go word for word and try to try to get a lawyer. If we were accused of something, what would we do? If we were accused of something, breaking the law, man, what we do, first thing we do is we get a lawyer, right? Get a lawyer. He tried to prove that we were innocent. He tried to prove that somehow we didn't really break this law by the wording of the law and, the way, and what it says. But that's not the way it is with God. You're guilty, you're guilty. And all you can do is acknowledge God. You know, God is not mine. The scripture says God is not mine. Okay. Do not, you can't deceive yourself. Don't, don't let anybody else deceive you. All you can do is, with God is be honest and open before him and tell him, God, I'm wrong. I need your help. Help, forgive me. Help me not to do it again. And God will help you. God will forgive you. God will help you. Now you may struggle with things for a while, but you will overcome in the long run. And if when you and it's the intent of your heart. If your intended uh, intent of your heart is not to sin, then you're gonna then even if you die and you haven't overcome something, you're gonna go to heaven. Okay? Because that's the intent of your heart. That's the intent of your heart, to overcome that thing, okay? Now, if you say, I'm just going to do this, I don't care, well, there's no, like we read. Now, let me, let me read another scripture to you. Let me read from the sixth chapter of Romans. The sixth chapter of Romans, verse four to six. For it is impossible, impossible, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Ghost, partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, seeing that they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. What is that saying? Is that saying that once you willfully sin, you can't be forgiven, you can't be saved? No, you can still be saved, but there's nothing anybody else can do. There's nothing anybody, you already know the gospel. You already know the good news. See, that's where we are in America. America has heard the gospel over and over. No place has, no, I don't think there's any place in the world that the gospel has been preached more than in America. And America has heard the gospel. And it's, it's no, the word gospel means good news, right? It's no longer news. Everybody's heard it. And people have rejected it. They say, well, that's not good. It's not good news. Not, every evil that are, that's in our society, they want to blame on Christianity. Well, the truth of the matter is, and anything good in our society comes from Christianity. You know, all our ancestors were barbarians until Christianity came along. Christianity, if you study Western civilization, Christianity civilized the Western world. Christianity did. Civilized the Western world. Now, if we reject Christianity, what's happening? When we see that happening, we're rejecting Christianity as a people, as a nation. What's happening? We're turning back to barbarians again. That's what's going to happen. We're going to turn back into barbarians because Christianity brought us out of barbarianism. And if we reject Christianity, the only place to go is back into barbarianism. We don't want to go back to our barbarianism. We want to follow the Lord. We love, we love him. You know, those of us who love him, we love his ways. We love God. We love his ways. We want, we want his ways. We want to learn. You know, the scripture says, show favor unto the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. Wickedness is the determination of the heart to sin. He doesn't want to learn to do it right. He doesn't love God's ways. He doesn't want God's ways. You know, Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him. Through him. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But this is a condemnation, 
that light has come into the world, and some men would not come to the light because their deeds were evil, and some men love that darkness rather than light. We have to determine what do we want. What do we want? Only you can determine that. No one else can. You have to determine. Do I want God's way? Do I want the world's way? If you choose the world's way, you're lost. If you choose God's way, God will forgive you. God will empower you. God will help you. You will be an overcomer. You will be more than a conqueror. You will go to heaven someday to be with the Lord. Okay? So, again, if we willfully sin, there's no, nothing anybody else can tell us. We already know. We already know the gospel. We already receive. And this is also comes against the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Okay? Because it says, tells us, those who have tasted of the goodness of God, tasted of the world, of the powers of the world to come, tasted of the Spirit of God. They've already been anointed. They already received Christ as their Savior. Then they decided to sin. See, like I said, God doesn't take away your free will once you sin. Now, let me let me go back to to John because there's some there's some scriptures in there that need to be explained. John, First John. Chapter 3. Let me get it. First John chapter 3. Okay. Whosoever committed sin, start at verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresses the law. Sin is a transgression of the law, or is against the nature of God. Not a, not a written law that we can finagle or we can try to wiggle out of. We can get a lawyer and try to prove that we're right. But it's, the, it's a transgression of the law. The nature of God, going against the nature of God. We know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin, that is in Christ. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. Okay? Again, all of sin. We're talking about practicing sin. It's talking about willful sin. I know this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. And we're going to do that. We don't really know Christ. We don't really know Christ. We're not in Christ. You know, when, when, when the Passover lamb was killed, the blood was spread upon the doors, and the death angel passed over the, the houses that had the blood on the doors. You know that if, if those people in that house were to go out in the street, that the firstborn of them would die just as, just as much as the, as the Egyptians. We have, to stay in, we have to stay in Christ. We have to stay in, to stay in Christ and to trust in him. To trust in him is to yield to him. He is Lord. We're going to yield to him, and he's going to change us and empower us to live differently. Okay? We can't, again, Jesus has to be our Lord, not just our Savior. He can't be our Savior without being our Lord. Some people want him as Savior, but not as Lord. He has to be our Lord and Savior. And if he is our Lord and Savior, we'll, we'll, we'll trust in him. We'll yield to him, and he will empower us. He will change us and empower us to live differently, to rise above our sins and our shortcomings and our faults. Okay. He'll anoint us to do it. That's what the anointing is. You know, I, I, I struggle. I try to, try to find a way to explain what the anointing was. The anointing, some people say, well, the anointing is the approval of God. Well, certainly God's not going to anoint what he doesn't approve of. But it's more than that. It's an empowerment. It's the, it's, it's the power of God. It's the power of God. It's the empowerment of the power of the Spirit of God to live differently, to rise above our faults and our shortcomings and our sin, and to live righteously. That's what the anointing is. It empowers us. There's an unction. There's a connection between us and God. And God is working on us and in us and through us. And God is empowering us to live differently. Okay? That's what the anointing is all about. And there is an anointing. It's not, not just an anointing to preach or anointing to sing or anointing to do this. There's an anointing to live life. Just to live life. Anointing to be a father. Anointing to be a mother. Anointing to be a worker. Anointing to be a neighbor. And all those things. To be what God wants you to be. Remember Jesus, and this is hard and difficult to understand, Jesus was 100% man, at the same time he was 100% God. Okay? These things are very difficult. It's difficult to understand the, the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, these are spiritual things. And we don't, we're, we're, we're earthly people. We're material people. We live in an earthly world. You know, science is good in its place. I'm not against science. Science is good on earthly things. You know, if I was... If I was going to buy a car from a used salesman, I've said this before, and he told me that his car is in perfect condition, I wouldn't just take his word for it. I'd want to start it up. I'd want to drive it around, see how it handles, see how it feels. You know, I want, in other words, in the natural things, we say, and science says, 
Prove it to me and I'll believe it. Prove it. I need proof. Prove it to me and I'll believe it. But in supernatural things and spiritual things, God says, believe me and I'll prove myself to you. See, it works the opposite way. There's things that science has its limitations. It can't do everything. It can do some amazing, amazing things, but it can't do everything, okay? There is a supernatural, there is a spiritual aspect to our world, and it's beyond the realm of science, okay? So, again, we're not saying that a person who willfully sins cannot be saved. He can be saved, but there's nothing that anybody else can tell him, because he's already heard the good news, he's already believed in the good news, he's already trusted in the good news. And, and he's tasted of the goodness of God. He is, and remember, when you become a Christian, God doesn't take away your free will. You had a free will to turn to God, and you have a free will to turn away from God. You have a free will to sin. Doesn't mean it's okay to sin, but you can sin. If I said to you, you can't drive through a red light. You can't drive through a red light, but you can. All you gotta do is look both ways, step on the gas, and you can drive through it, right? But you can't drive through it and say, I mean, you're a law-abiding citizen. Right? You're not supposed to drive through a red light. You can't drive through a red light, but you can drive through a red light. So when it says here that you can't sin, that a Christian can't sin, you can't sin and still be saved. You can't willfully sin. You're, in, you're on shaky ground. But you can sin. You have a free will. You can sin. But you can't sin and say you're still saved. You're still a Christian. You're still following God. You can't be in Christ and sin. If you're in Christ, then you're going to walk as he walked, in newness of life. That's what the scripture says. Any, anyone who's baptized into Christ has been baptized into his death. And as Christ was risen from the dead, you should walk in newness of life. In the newness, in the newness of life that God has given you. That, 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 the empowerment to live differently. That anointing to live differently. That the Spirit of God is enabling you to live differently. You're going to walk in that. It's up to you to decide to walk in that. So you have a decision to make. Otherwise, it's a vain grace. Okay? Vain grace. A vain, the Bible talks about a vain grace. What kind of grace do you have? You have a grace that works, that takes works and says, it's no longer work, it's just grace. But you have a vain grace. It says, I can just sin and keep on sinning, and, and it doesn't matter. It's up to you which one you want. But vain grace is not going to get you into heaven. True grace is going to get you into heaven. So, let's read just a little bit more. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. If you stay in Christ, you stay in Christ. If you're always, like we said, you stay in the house, you're not going to sin. Whoever sinneth hath not seen Christ, neither knoweth him. When you're outside of Christ, and you're not following Christ, you're not knowing what Christ, is, is, his will for you is, and you're, you're sinning, you're outside of Christ. When you sin, you're outside of Christ. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil. The devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God is made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, people say, well, I've been born again, so I can't sin. No. You, just like I said, you can't go through a red light, but you can go through a red light. Okay? You, 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 it's possible to do it, but you can't do it and say you're a law-abiding citizen. And you can't sin, can't, you can't continue in sin and not confess and turn from it and repent of it and say you're a Christian, okay? So, but it says you, and that, and let me say, it has a double meaning. There's the, Holy, the Holy Spirit will never lead you into sin. The Holy Spirit, remember you're born of the Spirit. That which is born of, the, of flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. If you follow the leading of the new nature, you have two natures, the old nature and the new nature. If you follow the leading of the new nature, the Holy Spirit, the nature of God, you're not, he's never going to lead you into sin. Okay? Now, this we know that there are people who say, you know, God told me to do this and God told me to do that, and they've done some awful things and done some sinful things. But listen, this is the difference. And, and it, may sound, it may sound like double talk, but it's not. You cannot understand the Word of God without the Holy Spirit. And you cannot understand the Holy Spirit without the Word of God. The two are in, uh, inextricably linked together. You can't separate them. They have, to be, they have to be the same. They have to be together. You're not going to understand the, whole, the Word of God unless the Holy Spirit leads you. Remember the scripture says, Lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. 
So you need to be directed by the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit to give you a revelation of the Word of God. But it also, you need the Word of God to give you direction whether it is the Holy Spirit or not. Now Jesus told us what the ministry of the Holy Spirit would be. The Holy Spirit would reveal Christ to us. The Holy Spirit would draw us to Christ. The Holy Spirit would change us and make us more like Christ. If it's not doing those things, it's not making us fall in love with Christ and draw us to Christ and change us and make us more like Christ, then it's not the Holy Spirit. Maybe some spirit, maybe a spiritual thing, but it's not the Holy Spirit. And if we can make ourselves holy, then what would we need the Holy Spirit for? Okay? Only the Holy Spirit can make us holy for God. That's why I say God is not, I mean, holiness is not the way to God, but God is the way to holiness. When we have God, the Holy Spirit in us, He will make us holy separated unto God. He will help us overcome our weaknesses. When we acknowledge our weaknesses, this is what Paul learned. If I acknowledge, when I'm weak, then I can be major. When I acknowledge my weakness, when I acknowledge my need for God, then I can draw strength from Him. Then I can be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? You understand that? So, when it says, uh, abstain from all appearance of evil, so remember, when something is apparent, when it becomes apparent to you that something is evil in something, then abstain from it. Don't, don't, don't bother with it. Don't, don't get involved with it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because there's evil in it. You may not know right away. It may take time for the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. But the Holy Spirit will reveal that to you. That's why there's, there's many Christians on different levels of spirituality. And sometimes people look down on other people. And it shouldn't be. Because God had patience with us. And we need to have patience with one another. We need to have patience with ourselves. Christian growth is a slow thing. Like I said before, it's like watching a tree grow. We look out the window and look at a, stare at a tree. It looks like it's not doing nothing. But it's growing little by little. If we come back five years later, we'll look at that tree and we'll see that it's grown wider, bigger, stronger. It's bearing fruit. Especially in the wintertime. We look at the tree in the winter and it looks dead. It looks like it's not doing anything. There's no leaves. There's no fruit. There's no buds. There's no nothing. But spring rolls around and, and it starts to blossom, the leaves start to come out, and it's the same thing, and it starts to bear fruit. The fruit starts to develop and it starts to ripen by the end of the season. And let me say this, when is the fruit ripest? When is the greatest harvest? When is the greatest harvest? Just before the, the trees go back into hibernation, just before, and think of plants, just before the plants die. That's when you get your tomatoes, that's when you get your peppers, that's when you get all the fruit. Just, just when the, before the plants are ready to die. So don't, so be patient with yourself. Be patient. You will bear fruit. You will bear fruit now, and you will bear fruit in the future. You will bear fruit in your old age, the scripture says. You will be fruitful in the things of God, in the nature and the character of Christ. You will be fruitful. Just hang in there. Have patience with God. Have patience with yourself. Have patience with others. You know, the scripture says through faith and patience we inherit the scripture. Not just through faith alone. We emphasize faith a lot of times. Faith is a trust in God. I trust God. I trust in Jesus. Because I trust in Him, I can yield to Him. Because I yield to Him. He's my Lord. I yield to Him. And He can, he can change me and make me what He wants me to be. Because I can't make myself that. There's no way. If I can make myself holy, again, what would I need the Holy Spirit for? Jesus wouldn't have to go to heaven and send the Holy Spirit back down to us. And just paying the price on the cross would have been enough. But He did. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit down to dwell in us, to change us, to make us what we should be, which we can't make us, to make us holy. We need the Holy Spirit. Remember, remember, I'll say it again. I said it twice, I'll say it three times. Holiness is not the way to God. God is the way to holiness. Just remember that. If you don't remember anything else, just remember that. Okay, I'll say it one more time. Holiness is not the way to God. God is the way to holiness. Now he says, be holy as I am holy. How could you be holy? How could you make yourself holy? You can't. You can't. You can get a, you can, you can, you can make a thousand excuses, but they're all just excuses why it should be, why you're holy or why you're, why you're not wrong, why you're not guilty. But it's just, it's nothing. If you acknowledge your guilt before God, ask for his mercy, ask for his forgiveness, ask for his help, he will anoint you, he will empower you, he will forgive you, he will send this Holy Spirit into you to make you holy. So I'm going to end with that. I thank you for, I hope that you paid attention to what I was saying. You may not agree with everything I said, but all I ask is you to consider what I said. Consider the things that I've shared. 
Consider that and, and let God speak to you. Let God direct you. Praise the Lord. I believe that he's directed me to share what I shared this morning. I did to the best of my ability. I know my voice isn't all that it should be. I'm getting older. But I ask you to, to pay attention. And uh, again, these are difficult scriptures to understand. And I know that, that people have different takes on them. But I ask you to consider what the Holy Spirit has shown me about these scriptures and see if they don't bless you and make a difference. You know, I often say, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to minister to someone, to help someone. All you have to do <coughs> is share the Word of God. If the Word of God has blessed you, has helped you in any way, it'll do the same for them if they receive it. So just share the Word of God, you know, in your, even in your own words, even to paraphrase it, share the Word of God. Let people know that it worked for you. you know, that's what witnesses, that's what testimony. If you're going to testify, what do you testify of? You're testifying to the truth of God's word. You're saying, this is what the word says, and I've experienced it. It's worked in my life. It's true. I can testify to that, that it's genuine, that it's real, that it's true, that it works. That's what I love about the word of God. It works. It works. It works. Praise the Lord. So I'll leave you with that this, this day. And I, again, I'll say, God bless you. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us, for your mercy, for your grace. Lord, for your for your empowerment, oh God, that you are able to lift us up, that you are able to empower us to live differently, that when we're tempted, we receive a crown of life, oh God, to empower us to live differently. We thank you for that, Jesus. And we're not going to fret, we're not going to worry, oh God, we're going to trust you and yield to you, and you're going to see us through, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise as we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.